All right, welcome back. In today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at some basic camera settings. Guess what? What you get from the manufacturer usually is not the best setup. So what they have done when they set these up is they basically are going to assume that the person's just going to turn on the camera and start taking photos. So they set it up in sort of a default mode. But the first thing you should do when you get your cameras actually change some of this. And I'm going to do some basics of explaining what it does and why and what I suggest. Some of the things we're gonna take a look at, image quality or type, autofocus modes, drive modes, ISO, metering modes, the auto lighting optimizer for Canon and active delighting for Nikon, I'm not sure if Sony has anything like this, but let's jump into it and take a look. So the main first option that we're gonna to need to take a look at is usually gonna be labeled in your menu system. So some of these are going to be buttons that you can toggle, and a lot of this is dependent on your camera. So it's really hard for me to explain how to change it, but it's pretty easy for me to describe what to change just because every camera is so different, even between a Nikon or a Canon, the various models, it, it really depends on what camera model you have as to how you change it. So the first thing we're gonna take a look at is JPEG or RAW. So a RAW file is going to be CR2, CR3, Nikon's NEF, DNG or Sony ARW or any other RAW files that the camera might shoot. RAW is also a term to describe an unedited image, but in this case, we're using the RAW file. So a JPEG is a compressed 8-bit file. So an 8-bit file has from white to black, 256 steps of gray. And it's a compressed file, meaning that when you save the image, some data, some or a lot, can be thrown away. In an uncompressed file, an image is made up of a bunch of pixels. And if we were to actually zoom way in and look at it, we would see the pixels. In uncompressed file, the file remembers every single pixel, everything about it. That results in a large file. A JPEG doesn't remember everything. So in an image like this, it sees this blue, which is the same color all through this, and it doesn't remember every single pixel. It remembers a few of them, maybe one here, 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 here. And then when it opens back up, it puts that same color pixel back in. That way it doesn't have to save everything. That being said, the uncompressed file is far superior. So if a JPEG is compressed in an 8-bit file, a RAW, and what a RAW file is, is a file that is just a capture. So the way a camera saves a JPEG is you take a picture, it goes through the camera's processor, it applies a bunch of stuff to it, and then it saves it. So it's processing the image in the camera. A RAW file, it takes the picture, but it doesn't process it. We do that after the fact in a program like Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. So what this gives you is flexibility in adjusting that image before it gets processed. And it makes a world of difference. A RAW file is usually a 16-bit file. However, most cameras can't shoot in 16-bit. In a program like Photoshop, you have the option to be either in 8-bit or 16-bit, but most cameras shoot in like 12 or 14-bit. So you don't really shoot in 16-bit, but you're working in 16-bit. 16-bit gives you a whole lot more information. It's like 64,500 shades of gray versus 256. Do we get that much? No. All you need to know is it is an insane amount more data than that 8-bit file. And that's really the reason to shoot a raw file. It gives you the flexibility to control it. And you'll see this once you move into a raw program. And it has a whole lot more data for you to work with. So is your adjusting and shifting stuff around, those shifts are not as drastic and you're able to pull more out of shadow and highlight detail than you would if you shot a JPEG file. Now, most RAW files are non-compressed, but a DNG, which is Adobe's RAW file, 
if you want to convert it does slightly compress the image so if you're first time setting up your camera i would definitely suggest shooting raw files however if you don't have a program to convert it your computer will not be able to view them if you're working on an apple you should be fine because it does read raw files but natively windows or pc does not so you would need a program now most cameras come with programs that will read your raw files our next setting white balance and and this is either a really really important one or not really important one and it's going to be dependent on what you just did before if you are shooting in jpeg you absolutely must know how to change the white balance on your camera because you can't do it after the fact if you are shooting a raw file it does not matter if you set this because you can do it after the fact in the program and this is one of the big benefits of shooting raw on the camera most cameras are going to have something like this which is similar it is also helpful to understand the kelvin temperature that's what the measurement is for white balance out of the box usually your neutral daylight is about 6500 kelvin by default your camera is going to be set up in this awb which is auto auto white balance which is fine if you're shooting raw however auto white balance isn't always right especially indoors or in mixed lighting situations so an example of mixed lighting would be like window light coming through as well as your ambient light from like can lights inside of your house they're usually going to be two completely different colors and then they mix so a lot of times you need to manually make a selection versus have the camera make that selection for you so if you're shooting jpeg this is going to be very very important that you learn how to use these different options because you can't easily change this after the fact you're kind of stuck with it all right we have daylight and then we have shade or shadow cloudy these are both very similar we have tungsten and we don't really have tungsten lights that much anymore so we really can almost add lcd lights lcd lights are going to be maybe a little bit higher kelvin than this i've seen them usually between uh, 4,000 and I'd say 5,500. Some even go up to 6,500 Kelvin. So it really depends on the light. We're going to have set for flash. We're going to have the ability to manually set this Kelvin number. And you can also do a custom white balance where you in the camera make your own custom white balance. That you will definitely need to read the manual because it varies so much it would be impossible for me to explain it. These are your different white balances. Usually on your camera, you're gonna have a button that says white balance, or if you go into the info panel, you'll see the white balance, and I will show you that later. And you'll need to go in and manually set this, and you'll need to do it all the time. Because if you set it for tungsten, and then you go outside and take pictures, it's gonna look horrible. When you look on the back of your camera, it's gonna look funky, and you're not gonna know why. So you need to get used to this. If you shoot raw, you can just leave it on auto, and you can change it after the fact. autofocus settings so we have four different types of autofocus settings and there is other autofocus settings that we're going to get into but they differ from what we are looking at now so this is usually going to be on the info panel or a button on your camera just depending on the camera and these are usually inside of your menu the first one we have an option is just to manually focus and manually focusing on these new digital cameras is really difficult. I would suggest that most people do not try to manually focus because it's hypersensitive. The next one we have is single servo as we see up here. And what single servo does is the camera will autofocus. And the way this works is you'll have an autofocus point or group of points in your camera. And the camera will try to autofocus on that. And then once it thinks it's in focus, it will stop and lock on that. It won't try to autofocus anymore. This is great for non-moving subjects, like a portrait or a statue, whatever it is. The next type is continuous servo. And in continuous servo, the camera will try to track moving subjects. 
think of a soccer game. The subject with the ball is moving. You have the focus point on the subject. And as that subject moves, the camera servo is going to track that subject and try to stay in focus. So that's continuous servo. Next, we have something called AI or matrix. I think Canon is AI and I think Nikon uses matrix. I'm not sure what Sony would use in this terminology, but basically what it does, it, it determines what you're focusing and it either uses single servo or continuous servo. So the camera will make the decision what to use. If it thinks the subject is moving, it's gonna use continuous servo. I'm not a fan of the camera making any decisions via the reason that I shoot in manual and most people shoot in manual. So I personally use continuous servo. Now there are some other modes that we're gonna get into here that are more advanced and are on some of the new cameras. So we'll take a look at those in a second. But if you need to set something at a default, I would suggest continuous servo. You will see here in a little bit, I use a rear or back button focus. So I can let go of that button and it will just stop focusing. So if I do need it to stop, I just let go of the button and it won't keep tracking the subject anymore. So in our newer cameras, especially the mirrorless cameras, we have some new options for autofocus. The first option we have is face detection and the camera will basically track the subject. We either track the subject or track the subject's face, depending on the camera and the model of the camera. To more refine that, we now have eye detection. And in this, the camera will autofocus on a human's eye. That's important to know on a human's eye. If you have something other than a human, you might need to change the setting. Most cameras have either pet detection or pet eye detection in which the camera will track the animal's eye. These work awesome for portraits. However, if you're not shooting a subject with either a person or an animal in it, it's not gonna to be too helpful. So you're gonna to need to learn to know how to change this stuff so that your camera can be set in the best possible settings that you can get it into. So those are some of the newer advanced settings. All right, so I have this little slide up and we just looked at the different autofocus settings. If you're not using an eye or a pet or a subject detection, you can set the camera in a couple of different modes. One mode is going to be an expanded setting in which everything in this whole area, you just imagine these points don't even exist. This whole area right here is the area in which the camera uses to locate a subject. And it's going to try to focus on that. Now the problem is if you have two people in there, it might not know which person or subject to focus on or whether to focus on the hand, the foot, the arm, the leg, whatever. But it has this wide area. And this is helpful like if you're trying to photograph a bird or something that's really tiny and moving around. So wide area of focus. Then next, just don't think about this red dot here. Just think about all these little dots. So we have not as wide here, but we have this large group. So in this mode, you would be able to set all these different points as active. So anything within this area, the camera's gonna focus on. And then the last one is down here, it's easiest to see, is what we call single point autofocus. And basically whatever this little point is on, the camera's gonna focus on. And this can be difficult like for that bird that moves all around, but this is great for a subject like a person if you don't have eye detection, because you can put this little dot right on the eye and focus. And by using single point, it's going to be more accurate as far as focusing. Now, you can move the single point around. It does not need to be in the center. So here you could have a mode like this where you can move it to any one of these single points and you can toggle that point to move. You could move it through any of these points here, these points here, or these points here, just depending on how many of these points you want active in the camera. Look, it could take a long time to move it around 
these different points and less time to do it here because they're just not as many. The goal here is to understand that there's different ways to make the camera and depending on what you're shooting, some are gonna be better than others. By default, I leave mine in single point autofocus um, and I just move it around. Once you get good at this, you can do this really fast, but occasionally I will move to one of these other modes. All right, next we have shutter drive settings. And what this refers to is basically how the camera takes pictures. So the shutter is a mechanical object in which it opens and closes. You'll usually hear that when you take a camera, that's what goes click, 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 click like that. So single means every time that you press the shutter button on the front, it will take one image. You can hold it down, it's still only gonna take one image. The next option is continuous. And in continuous, you will hold the shutter down and as long as you hold the shutter down, the camera will take pictures until you run out the buffer, which means it can only take so many images before it needs to write to a card. So that could be three images, that could be 200 images. It really just depends on the camera. But it will continuously take pictures as fast as it can, as long as that shutter is depressed. Now, some cameras have a high and a low setting, meaning it will do it continuous slow or continuous high. It just really depends on the camera. Next, we have timer modes in which you can have the timer go. So you will press the shutter button and the camera will take an image either after two seconds or 10 seconds. One thing I will suggest if you do stick it in timer, remember to stick it back into single or continuous after you're done or next time you'll turn on the camera like I do, press it and then have to wait 10 seconds before it takes a picture, it drives me nuts. One thing to note, the newer mirrorless cameras have both a manual shutter and an electronic shutter and they will let you use either one, meaning it will have a traditional shutter that goes up and down and it will use that to take the picture. It also has an electronic shutter in which the mirror will go up and then electronically it will take an image. Now an electronic can take a much faster burst of images. So usually when you do continuous, or a camera, it will tell you it can take five images a second or 10 images a second. With an electronic shutter, sometimes you can take up to 20 images a second. By default, I have my camera on continuous because you never know what's gonna happen. So even though you're taking a portrait and you might only wanna take one at a time, something can happen, a bird could fly into their face and you would just wanna get a burst off as that bird crashes into them. So continuous is my default. The next thing we have is ISO settings, and this is really gonna be determined on how you're taking your images. If you're using one of the automatic modes or a semi-automatic mode, and you're not really interested in learning how to shoot in manual, you can probably just leave it in an auto setting and be done with it. However, if you're in one of my classes or you wanna learn how to be more accurate with your metering, I would suggest you take it out of the auto mode. So auto is simple, you set auto, the camera is automatically gonna pick the correct aperture to get the correct exposure. If you stick it in manual, you will need to adjust it. Now there are more settings than these, but these are just some examples of 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200. So if you learn about the exposure triangle, you'll understand what these numbers mean and how to manually set them. In my classes, we're always gonna be manually setting them. I always use a manual ISO. So this next one's a weird one, and I don't think most people have ever heard of it. it it's an auto toning setting, and I don't know if Sony has one, but I know Canon and Nikon do, and I tell all students that I have, to turn it off because it, it will auto tone. And if you're shooting a JPEG image, this might be helpful in which the camera automatically adjusts to get more out of the, usually the shadow area. Um, could be the highlight, but more in the shadow area of your camera. In the case of shooting in RAW, 
we want to have the ability to adjust this ourselves, And because the image hasn't been processed, we're going to have the ability to do that in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. So in this case, I always tell students to turn auto lighting optimizer and deactive lighting off. But if you are shooting JPEG, uh, it might be helpful to leave it on. The next thing we have is color space. This is probably something that most people have never heard of, but it is in the menu options and most cameras by default are gonna be set on sRGB. sRGB is the color space of the web. So if you put something on the web, it uses the color space of sRGB. However, Adobe RGB has a larger color gamut, meaning, meaning that it has more colors available in its color gamut than sRGB does. So I would say if you're going to be shooting for print, use Adobe RGB. If you're going to be using print and web, use Adobe RGB because you can convert this really easily. It doesn't make a difference. The other thing to know is color space is only applied to a JPEG image. Remember, I told you that the camera processes that JPEG image, well, one of the things it will do is assign a color space to it, depending on whatever you set up. So if you shoot raw, it doesn't really matter what you have set because you're gonna be applying it after the fact. But if you just wanna set it and forget it, pick the one that you want, um, you're only gonna most likely have sRGB and Adobe RGB. Um, sometimes it's labeled Adobe RGB 1998, but they kinda are getting rid of that 1998 since it's so long ago and now it's just referred to as Adobe RGB. The next thing that we have here is highlight alert and how this is gonna be displayed is gonna differ between manufacturers. So this is kind of what it looks like on the Canon one. And basically what's gonna happen is if you're taking an image, highlights are overexposed, meaning they're too bright, it's gonna flash or let you know somehow whether it's by a red color or lines or a weird grayed out area, whatever it is, it's gonna let you know. And this is helpful. So when you look at the LCD in the back, when you're outside, it's kind of hard to tell if the exposure is good or not. A lot of times if you look, it looks good, but then when you open the image up, it's still too bright when you look at the LCD when it's bright outside. So this is helpful that you can take the picture and get it so that the highlight alert isn't flashing. And basically what this is saying is, hey, you took this picture, but you've lost all your highlights. Even if you have a raw image, if you take it and you shoot it and it has no highlights, you cannot get them back. That is a bad thing in photography. This next one refers to how to activate the autofocus. So by default on the camera, you have the shutter button in the front and you'll depress it halfway and this will activate your autofocus to start. Whatever one of those modes that we had selected before. This is just how you activate it and get it to work. You press it halfway down, it starts to focus. All right, if you hold it halfway down after it's focused on something, it will stop focusing. When you press the butter the whole way down, it will take the picture. So one of the problems with this button on the front is it has a whole bunch of things that it does. It turns the camera, activates the metering, it activates the autofocus, it works the autofocus, and it takes the picture. So it can be kind of difficult to kind of work with. So what I've done for, gosh, I don't know, 25 years, is switch that to a button on the back of the camera. And it's either referred to as rear or back button autofocus. And what this is, is an independent control, meaning that if you press it, it's autofocusing. If you let go of it, it stops autofocusing. And so I use continuous, you remember, where it always tracks the subject. But if I have a subject that I'm shooting as a portrait, I can focus on them, let go of this button, and it's not gonna try to focus anymore, no matter what I do, because it's an independent control. I have a video that goes way more into depth in how to autofocus like a pro. So if you're interested in that, I will leave it in the description below.
format or delete. I put this in here because I think it's important because there's basically two ways to remove images from the memory card, a good one and a bad one. Delete is the bad one. So when you delete your images over and over and over again, it can cause like bad sectors in your card and it's gonna make your card crash and go bad. So if you wanna take the images off your card, the better option is use format. And format is also located in the camera menu. So you go in the camera menu, you go to format and you'll say, yes, you wanna reformat the card. That is a much better option. Do not use delete, use format. So I brought this video up because depending on the camera, look, if you have a lower end camera, a lot of the options that we have, you need to go into this little eye or an info menu or something that is shown on the back of your LCD. So if it is touchscreen, you can just touch them and they'll open up. On some of the higher end cameras, you'll actually have a button to press to do those. The first one here is your mode. And this is program, auto, shutter priority, aperture priority, manual, and then the kind of like dummy modes, I call them, where it's like portrait mode, sports mode, stuff like that. That we didn't go over in this, but that is a command dial that lets you pick this. And that's usually gonna be on there. This is going to be your shutter speed. This is gonna be your aperture. This is showing your ISO. This is showing what autofocus setting you have, right? And then how many pictures you've taken. Autofocus is gonna be right here. But to go in to change it, you would actually go into this AF auto. You would either tap this or select this, and then it will let you change that autofocus to either eye or single point autofocus, whatever you choose to use. The next thing that we have is metering. Now, I didn't really go into metering settings. Um, you can change your metering settings, whether it's LCD display, so you might not need to hit it. So either way, and look, this is just one camera. Another camera might be configured differently, but this is basically what it's gonna have. The last is your ISO, whether you're using auto or you're using you know, 100, 200. This is just telling us what type of, of card that we have. So this is the little info button. You might see a button on the back of your camera that has an eye. You would hit this and this would pop up and display. But usually the default, this pops up anyways in your... Lastly, we have ISO. So this is in a manual mode where we have it set at 100. It could be set at auto if you didn't change that, but this is showing you how it's set. What's important is you learn the quickest way of how to change these. As you get more advanced cameras, they have more buttons and they make it easier for you to change this stuff. But in the lower end cameras, they don't think you're ever gonna change it, so they make it more difficult and it's a little bit more complex sometimes to figure the process out. Well, that's it for basic camera settings. Hopefully you have found this video helpful. If you did, you could give us a thumbs up. That would be wonderful. If you have any comments or questions, you can always leave those below. And don't forget to subscribe.